Hi friends, welcome to the discussion of the subject of pathology. We are going to be having a discussion of the chapter of cell injury. Now during the discussion of the chapter of cell injury, we are going to be having several subunits in which the discussion is going to take place. We are first going to be having a discussion about the topic of cell injury under the heading of the different causes of cell injury. I shall then explain you about the different types of adaptations which are going to be seen inside the cell wherein we talk about atrophy, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, metaplasia and dysplasia. Subsequently, we are going to be having a look at the different subtypes of cell injury wherein we talk about reversible cell injury and the different patterns of irreversible cell injury with special emphasis and detailed discussion of the necrosis and subtypes, apoptosis and the other special mechanisms by which the cells are going to suffer from irreversible cell injury. Then our focus is going to be shifting on the different types of pigmentation and finally we are going to be having a discussion about the special points or the special vignettes which are supposed to be kept in mind so as to crack the clinical questions which are likely to be asked in the exam from this particular topic. So let's get started. Starting with the discussion of the topic of cell injury friends, we need to understand the fact that whenever there is any disease taking place in the body, it means that the organs are not functioning properly. And why would the organs not functioning properly? Because there is some injury at the level of the constituent tissues, which means that there is some injury at the level of cells. So injury at the level of cells is the fundamental reason why the cells are going to be suffering from an injury or dysfunction. Now there can be lot of causes of development of this kind of an injury. For example, if we look at a newborn baby, there are situations when a baby is born with certain kind of problems. So these disorders are going to be given the name of congenital disorders. There are certain types of genetic enzyme deficiencies that you have read in biochemistry because of which the patients are going to be developing clinical manifestations. We can be having physical factors, for example, extremes of temperature, you understand about heat stroke, frostbite, one condition because of too much of a temperature, the other condition because too lesser temperature, that can be causing a trouble. We can be having different types of infectious organisms which we read in microbiology, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, parasites which can be causing a trouble. But all in all, if we look at the causes of cell injury, the most common reason of development of injury at the level of cells happens to be hypoxia. Now the name itself is self-explanatory, hypo means less, oxia means oxygen. So whenever we are talking about less availability of oxygen at the level of the cells, this is going to be the most common reason for development of injury at the level of the cells. Now there can be multiple reasons why the cell is going to be not getting sufficient amount of oxygen. And this is going to be associated with recalling a bit of normal physiology first. So looking at the diagram which is appearing in, on the screen in front of you, you please appreciate the fact that there are four important steps after which the cells are able to utilize oxygen. The first step is the air is going to be containing around 21% oxygen and this oxygen is now going to be entering inside the lungs. Second step, the oxygen from the lungs diffuses into the blood vessels and now it is going to combine with the hemoglobin present in the RBCs. So now the RBCs are going to get oxygenation of the hemoglobin. The red color of the hemoglobin that I have denoted in the diagram is going to change to the red color. The green color, sorry, is going to get converted into the red color. So that is responsible for the formation of oxygenated hemoglobin. The third step is the oxygenated blood is going to be transported to the cells or the tissues. And finally, this oxygen is going to be diffusing into the cells and therefore it is going to be utilized by the cells for its different metabolic processes. Now any interference at any of these four steps can be responsible for causing a trouble at the level of the cells. So let us say and understand that if there is going to be a trouble at the level of step 1, which means that if a person is going to be breathing in less concentration of oxygen, this is a condition that is going to be given the name of hypoxic hypoxia. Hypoxic hypoxia. Now such a condition is typically going to be seen in case of an individual who is going to be going to a high altitude. So in the clinical vignette question, they talk about a person who happens to be a mountaineer or they talk about an individual who is going to be going up a high altitude and then he suffers from a hypoxic injury. Possibility number two, the oxygen which is being breathed in has no issues, but there is a problem at the level of the formation of the oxyhemoglobin. If there is reduced oxyhemoglobin formation, this condition is going to be given the name of anemic hypoxia. Now when you look at the name anemic hypoxia, it automatically gives you a hint. What we are talking about over here is less formation of oxyhemoglobin in the RBC. Now two important reasons why there is going to be anemic hypoxia. Reason number one, the RBC itself is containing less amount of hemoglobin. So if there is less amount of hemoglobin available to bind with the oxygen, logically oxyhemoglobin concentration is going to be less than normal. 
and this is going to be responsible for causing the development of anemic hypoxia. So when we are talking about an adult individual, as per the World Health Organization criteria, an adult male is said to be having anemia if his hemoglobin is going to be less than 13 gram per deciliter. Similarly, an adult female is going to be called as anemic if she is having a hemoglobin less than 12 gram per deciliter. So conditions like anemia are associated with development of anemic hypoxia that is clear from the name itself. One special condition which examiners love to trap you in happens to be a type of a poisoning which is given the name of the carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, particularly in the winter weathers when we are using the heaters or let's say we are talking about the use of gas geysers or let us say we are talking about the different type of the situation which are going to be used for making us warm. Let's say in our country we are using the angitis. So, conditions in which you are going to be having the burning of a fuel and typically this fuel is going to be having an incomplete combustion. On top of it, such a heater or such a gas geyser or such a ET is kept in a room which is not very well ventilated. So this is going to be associated with formation of a gas that is carbon monoxide. Now carbon monoxide if you recall from a knowledge of physiology has a very very strong attachment with hemoglobin. It has almost more than 210 times the affinity for hemoglobin in comparison to oxygen and carbon dioxide. As a result of which, if the carbon monoxide attaches itself with hemoglobin, it is going to result in the formation of carboxyhemoglobin. And as and when we are talking about the formation of carboxyhemoglobin, such a hemoglobin becomes unavailable to bind with the normal oxygen. Logically, therefore, the concentration of oxyhemoglobin is going to get reduced. And therefore, please remember the fact carbon monoxide poisoning would be an example of anemic hypoxia. So, in the clinical question where there is a poorly ventilated room, use of a ngiti or a heater or a gas geyser, and then the individual is going to be having the development of hypoxia-like manifestations, think in terms of anemic hypoxia. Condition number three can be that the individual is going to be suffering at the level of the vascular supply. So, that type of uh, trouble is what is going to be given the name of a uh, stagnant hypoxia. Now, as the name gives you hints, stagnation means a problem can be taking place at the level of the blood supply. Either this can be an arterial problem, which means the blood supply from the artery into the concerned tissue is going to be reduced. That is going to be given the name of ischemia. Or problem number two can be that there is an improper drainage or obstruction at the level of the venous drainage that is going to be given the name of congestion. Now, when we compare the arterial versus the venous cause, it is found that in majority of the situations, there is a problem at the level of the artery. So, very easy question that you need to answer in the exam is, the commonest reason for development of hypoxia at the level of cells happens to be ischemia. Commonest cause of cell injury, that is hypoxia. Commonest cause of hypoxia happens to be ischemia. Such a condition is going to be therefore remembered by you because this is going to be very commonly asked in the exams. A fourth example of a situation can be the person breathes in normal air. It is getting properly diffused into the blood, formation of oxyhemoglobin. There is a proper vascular supply to the cells, but for some problem, the cells are not able to utilize this oxygen. That means at the level of the cell itself, there is a trouble. And when you have a problem at the level of cell, the Latin term for cell or the tissue is histo. Histology is what you read in anatomy, right? So there is a problem at the level of cells that is going to be given the name of histotoxic hypoxia. Typically, this is something that you associate in case of a poisoning, what is termed as the cyanide poisoning. So the cyanide poisoning is going to be important because it is responsible for interfering with the functioning of the electron transport chain. You remember it interferes with the functioning of the cytochrome and therefore it will not allow the oxygen to get properly utilized by the cells. Point to be remembered therefore that cyanide poisoning is associated with histotoxic hypoxia whereas I repeat if we are talking about carbon monoxide poisoning that would be an example of anemic hypoxia. Not to forget the fact overall if we compare the four causes the commonest reason for development of hypoxia or reduced availability of oxygen at the level of cells is going to be because of reduction in the blood supply to the cells or the tissues that is going to be given the name of ischemia. Now if you are going to be reducing the vascular supply to different organs in the body depending upon their own metabolic rate depending upon their own sensitivities certain tissues are going to be very sensitive it's almost a routine situation for some of us having less amount of money having some kind of a disparagement against us we are very touchy. For some people, they are mentally more strong like you people watching the videos with cerebellum and you are the ones who are going to be relatively resistant to all kind of naysaying, all kind of negativity. Point is, when we are talking about the sensitivity of the tissues, certain cells, for example, we are talking about the cells of the central nervous system, the neurons, 
They're extremely, extremely sensitive to deprivation of oxygen even for few seconds to one or two minutes. The next sensitive cells in our body happens to be the cells like the cardiac cells. So the cardiac cells are again going to be extremely sensitive. We are having the presence of relatively resistant cells in the form of, let us say, the skeletal muscle fibers and still resistant cells like the cells responsible for the deposition of fibrous tissue at the time of wound healing, the fibroblasts. The point therefore is that when we are talking about the most sensitive cell in the body, it is typically the neurons. And in comparison, when we are talking about the cells which are relatively resistant, we can always talk about something like the fibroblast. Two clinical importances. Fact number one, whenever we are having a situation in which there is a deprivation of the blood supply, either to the brain, the condition is termed as stroke, ischemic stroke, or we are talking about a decrease in blood supply to the heart, the condition associated with ischemic myocardial damage, that is myocardial infarction and heart attack, you immediately rush the patient to the hospital so that the vascular supply can be restored, so that the patient can be treated or well. Why? Because these are very sensitive cells. If you restore the blood supply, the patient can get better. Fact number two, you are familiar with certain areas in the body which are going to be more sensitive. For example, almost all the parts of the brain which are being supplied by let us say the anterior, the middle and the posterior cerebral artery, this is going to be extremely sensitive. With respect to the heart, we have area which is given the name of the subendocardial region. Subendocardial region which happens to be like really sensitive to the development of any kind of an ischemic damage. With respect to something like the intestine, you have heard of something like the watershed areas. The areas where you are going to be having the less development of collaterals, where there is going to be something like an end arterial blood supply. Just for the sake of a recapitulation, you are all familiar with the Griffith point, splenic flexure. If I just have to recall that large intestine diagram for you remember splenic flexure or we are talking about something like for example we are talking about the rectosigmoid junction what has been given the name of sudex point so certain areas in different organs of the body are going to be metabolically more sensitive and therefore these are going to be more prone to the development of ischemic damage having said that we just need to be familiar with the commonest cause of cell injury being hypoxia the commonest cause of hypoxia being ischemia and the sensitivity of different types of cells. We now proceed to the discussion of what exactly would happen in context of the different patterns of cell injury. Now having a discussion about what exactly is going to be seen in context of a patient who is going to be suffering from reversible cell injury. As we discussed few minutes back, whenever there is going to be a decrease in the oxygen supply, the first organelle which is going to get affected happens to be the mitochondria. Now because you are going to be having less amount of oxygen which is available, the functioning of the mitochondria is going to be interfered with. And now it is going to be producing less number of ATPs. ATPs being the energy currency of the cell, if they are being produced in less numbers, they are likely to cause different types of manifestations which are seen in the cell. And these are the exact manifestations which the examiners sometimes love to ask you. Manifestation number one is going to be related to the reduced functioning at the level of the cell membrane. Now we understand that in the cell membrane, we are having the presence of a sodium potassium ATPase pump. This pump has a main function, it brings in potassium, it throws out sodium. But this pump requires ATP. If there is less amount of ATP which is available, sodium cannot be thrown out of the cell. So, concentration of sodium inside the cell is going to increase. Sodium has a natural tendency, it is going to attract water. So, if you have more sodium inside the cell, you will be having this change followed by more water entering inside the cell. If more water enters inside the cell, the cell is going to increase in its size. And if that happens, you would be having increase in the cell size or cellular swelling taking place because of more water that is going to be given the name of a hydropic change. So hydra means water and this hydropic change is important because this is usually the first microscopic manifestation associated with reversible cell injury. You could be having a situation wherein because of the entry of more water, the cell is going to be having the presence of swelling of the organelles. An additional thing which can be seen at times in the cells can be because of a presence of more water. In order to accommodate the more water, you are going to be having outpouchings like this. The balloon-like outpouchings in the membranes of the cell within the organelles and within the plasma membrane. Such outpoutings are going to be given the name of, this is going to be given the name of bleb formation. Now, it may so happen that if you are talking about certain special tissues, for example, if you are talking about the cardiac tissue, if you are talking about the hepatic tissue, they are extremely important in the lipid metabolism. So when there is less availability of ATP, these are going to be having accumulation of the triglycerides inside them. 
and if there is a triglyceride accumulation inside the hepatocyte and the cardiac cell this is going to be associated with the term fatty change so three points that we need to remember first organelle affected at the time of reversible cell injury is the mitochondria hydropic change is usually the first microscopic manifestation of reversible cell injury but when we are talking about reversible cell injury fatty change or accumulation of lipid droplets is going to be seen in two important organelles the cardiac tissue and the hepatic tissue apart from the cell membrane we are also going to be having a dysfunction at the level of the endoplasmic reticulum now endoplasmic reticulum are of two types we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum which contains the ribosomes associated with protein synthesis and this protein synthesis requires energy so logically if you have less energy inside the cell then the protein synthesis is also going to get affected so there is going to be a reduction in the protein synthesis the second type of endoplasmic reticulum that we are aware of is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum which is associated with the metabolism of different substances so even that is going to be having a hampering of its functioning a third important change that we need to have an idea over here happens to be in context of the nucleus of a cell whenever we are talking about the glucose metabolism the glucose metabolism takes place in two steps first glucose is going to get converted into the pyruvic acid by the process of glycolysis and second this pyruvic acid is then going to enter inside the tca cycle or the krebs cycle whenever we are having a deprivation of oxygen at the level of the cell then the metabolism of glucose will take place primarily by the process of glycolysis and now you would be having a increased concentration of lactic acid or pyruvic acid inside the cell any accumulation of an acid inside the cell is would be associated with intracellular acidosis and because of this intracellular acidosis you would be having a change inside the cell especially in context of the nucleus which is given the name of the clumping of chromatin in simplified terms clumping of chromatin just means the fact that you are going to be having a relatively uniform appearance of the nucleus in a normal cell however whenever there is an intracellular acidosis you would be having a patchy accumulation of the nucleic acid material and that is what is being termed as the clumping it may also happen so that when you are having the entry of more water inside the cell sometimes a fragment of a membrane whether we are talking about the plasma membrane or whether we talk about the membrane of the organelle can get partly broken down if such a situation happens you know what will happen this broken down membrane would be appearing inside the cell in a form of a spiral and this kind of a spiral structure is going to be given the name of myelin figures let me just try to show you that with the help of a diagrammatic representation so myelin figures are nothing they're just spiral like structures and how are they produced they are made up of phospholipids because of entry of more water this is a part of the membrane and this membrane is now going to be having a curling upon itself this is going to be given the name of myelin figures so myelin figures are going to be seen usually with the help of high power magnification or electron microscope examination and they are going to be again seen as a feature of reversible cell injury so what are the three take home points the earliest organelle affected happens to be mitochondria the earliest microscopic feature associated in case of reversible cell injury is hydropic change expect for the fact that when we are talking about the hepatocyte or the cardiac tissue we would be having the presence of fatty change over there and then we need to be familiar with the fact that the nuclear change that is loved by the examiners happens to be the clumping of the chromatin primarily because of the presence of the intracellular acidosis now what is the importance of knowing about all these facts these changes are taking place because you are depriving the cell of oxygen however the good news is that if you are able to restore the oxygen supply at the level of the cells these all changes are going to disappear that's the reason why you are using the term reversible over here so in case the individual comes to us and we are able to restore the oxygen supply these changes are going to get totally reversed however if the persisting insult is seen if the hypoxia is for a longer duration of time it is if it is taking place for a greater duration of time then the cells are going to be suffering from cell death and that could be one of the associated mechanisms of irreversible cell injury about which we are going to be just having a discussion in next few minutes